Hi, uh, my name is Keo Griffith, and today uh, I'm chiming in from Santa Ana Grand Central Art Center. Um, I usually don't have an art studio space, and this year has been kind of challenging, moving around quite a bit. Uh, my friend John Spiek, who runs this Grand Central Art Center, has been very kind to let me use this uh, space here for today. So we'll be talking to you from here. It depends what the overview is going to be, if it's spanning back a couple of decades or three decades. <laughs> um, during my undergrad, I had a tendency to uh, please the audience and um, the school, the university, which was Otis, uh, to make work that was more Western canon oriented. And I always felt that I was shortchanging myself a little bit because of my heritage being half Japanese. Uh, lately, uh, since I've been going to grad school, and I happen to have earned my master's degree this year under this corona world, um, I focus more on the Japanese side to kind of counterbalance <laughs> the experience. Um, so during the three decades, um, I, I got a degree in communication uh, design for my undergrad, which was more graphic design oriented. I have a tendency to make iconic work. Uh, I rely on things that are easy to understand because my ideas t have a tendency to be very abstract and uh, quite cryptic actually. And the cryptic part um, ends up coming from my background, which is bilingual, bicultural, uh, you know, a duality that kind of coexists that I can't really separate from each other. And uh, it brings me to a position where sometimes I would blurt out things that don't make sense to me. It would be, it would be like a co combination of English and Japanese fused together, like, you know, it comes out like a chunk. Um, but, you know, it's part of my fabrication. So uh, I've been living like this my whole life. Um, and in the beginning, uh, when I was a child, my father, who was, you know, one of the first influences, of course, he was a, uh, <clears throat> a opera tenor uh, major at Juilliard School of Music in New York. So I was, I would wake up in the morning since, uh, you know, very young, two or three years old, uh, with the record playing right next to me my, by my bed. He would play just classical music primarily, some jazz. And then after playing one of the records, his ritual would be to, you know, practice. He would sing for about an hour in the distance. So every morning I would wake up to music, basically, and, and some kind of vocal activity. Um, that being my first experience uh, of any sort of uh, expression, artistic expression, has led me to make a lot of sound work in my and sound meaning um, where it's more physical because of the vibration I uh, sensed and uh, been exposed to with my father's um, embodiment and you know um, just how he projected his voice and, and the effect that he got from doing that. So um, I like using material for one thing and I like really investigating material like you know uh, metal, glass, wood and see how the sound gets conducted through these materials and also con combining these things and also having them set in a space all matters in my work. Um, in undergrad uh, I participated in uh, performances being in 
experimental bands uh, and also um, doing uh, kind of semi fluxus kind of performance work uh, in the 80s in um, LA. Otis was uh, in the MacArthur Park area. So we had um, basically uh, to a disposal all these buildings and um, you know empty storefronts. It's funny because you know in the Corona world right now it's very similar to where I started school. You see just empty lots and empty spaces like this. <laughs> Uh, one of my favorite places to go hang out was the old Sheraton Hotel uh, by Lafayette Park Place. Uh, all five stories, maybe there are more than that. It's an old Art Deco hotel. And on the second level, they had a huge ballroom. Completely um, abandoned, really, uh, with a grand piano and you know chandeliers. And it was like the perfect place to practice and, you know, uh, re rehearse, you know, these kind of haphazard, impromptu performances. And that's kind of the beginning of uh, being, getting the experience to work in site-specific areas that happen to be available, that I, I happen to stumble upon. Um, so, you know, this, this accidental space in my current practice ends up being these spaces that uh, curators would ask me if I could do something with. Uh, one of my, the current projects I'm working with is uh, a remote island in uh, the Inland Sea in Japan. It's like two islands east of, uh, maybe three, east of Naoshima which you probably know. It's the famous contemporary art island. And it's a village, it's a small island, uh, probably about two miles stretch, inhabited by 66 fisher men and fisher, well, fishing people, <laughs> men and women, village. Um, and that's how they support themselves. They, don't, they, they are very self-sufficient, sustainable, they, they eat off their own land, grow vegetables, and they have these fishing boats that they each, uh, each of them call that their, their own cars that they can use. Um, <clears throat> so what I found out about the history of the island is uh, it's famous for this uh, uh, popular Japanese song from the 70s. And for some reason, the women from other areas, uh, from the mainland in Japan and other islands, end up wedding these fishermen on this island. <laughs> it's almost like a Greek myth in, in this inland sea, which, it, which kind of look, it looks like a Mediterranean area. It's also famous for olives. Um, so I, I thought that was very interesting that, you know, they have this ritual and the, the, the bride stands up on a boat and meets the, the uh, husband, her future husband. Almost like a, um, you know, the, the famous Botticelli painting of the Venus and the clam <laughs> seashell. It's that sort of thing, but it's, it's a boat, it's a fishing boat. <laughs> So what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm, I'm doing more work where I work with uh, local areas and taking my experience of growing up with a popular song and then referring it back to the actual space where it came from and then meeting these people. So in, in this case, it would be these women who were you know, brides in their 20s who are now in their 60s and 70s and 80s now. And I've met 20 of them. And my, this current project I'm working on is called The Brides of Seto. 
set was the, uh, the inland sea, name of the inland sea area. So uh, my idea is that, you know, when you talk about feminist art or feminist, feminism, it seems to be mostly related to urban areas. And I, I wanted to see how it would relate if you went out out of that per periphery into the countryside, into this island with 66 people. How does it exist there? So that, that's my project. When I was in quarantine in Japan, in my mother's house, <laughs> I didn't know if she was going to be able to come back home or not. So I had to think about plan B is, you know, vacating the home, terminating her lease at the apartment, uh, and then, you know, gathering up her belongings. And then I discovered these boxes of slides that my mother and my father had. Um, and it goes as far back as 1946. My father's first slides when he, um, I think he was uh, in New York. And then a year or two later, he ended up in Korea uh, for the war. Uh, but you know, he couldn't really do anything because he was only a singer. <laughs> so I think what he told me was uh, his, his chore was to um, gather rice for the troops <laughs> and do desk work. So, um, but anyway, it ha there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of these slides, you know, Kodak and Fujifilm, <laughs> vice versa. And, you know, I've been scanning these while I was in quarantine and thinking that maybe this would become something, you know, later on. And, and thinking about the medium of the slides that are also um, collect, you know, um, fading away. Uh, rotting, you know, part of it has fungus growing, you know, stuff like that. So it's photography that's also uh, mutating in a way, right? It's become transforming into some kind of other or organism. So I find that to be kind of interesting when, what happened to my mother and then this happening to the slides and, and the history. And then, you know, uh, this project at the island with the fishermen and, and the brides, the old ladies. There's, you know, kind of this loose project that goes on where um, I take up a space, in a, like this kind of space, and I fill out the whole uh, floor, square footage, with some material. Um, I've done it a few times before and usually I would use uh, something like this, like an aluminum foil, because of the sound that it makes. So I would uh, pretty much furnish, you know, have it in the whole room, wall to wall, installed with this, and then invite a few people to part perform with me. And I'll give them simple instructions, kind of like fluxus based where I would tell them to fold in triangles towards the center. And then as the sh space shrinks, you know, the analogy is that, you know, our living spaces keep shrinking and shrinking and our rents get higher. So I thought about that too. And so as the space shrinks, you have to jump out of the performing space and you become the audience. And at the very end, uh, the material, which is now sound, it's not aluminum foil anymore, the sound becomes an object, and the object wraps into the person who's left alone in that space, and then becomes a sound sculpture. So that's, that's the sort of idea that I'm kind of working with, where you take material, you peel it off the, the space, the physical space, and then it becomes sound, and then the sound becomes object again. Um, I'm going to show you this work here. This was first made in 2013, uh, like about a year and a half after the, the tsunami 
earthquake um, disaster in Japan. And I think like a half a year or a year later, I kept on seeing these things in the news where um, the American West Coast would complain that all this, you know, uh, radiation waste is washing ashore in the West Coast. And I thought about, well, what kind of uh, radiation waste is washing up? And, you know, and then I thought, well, it's got to be like chopsticks and plates and, you know, rice and everything that's related to Japan. And then, and then I thought about, well, what kind of message is it bringing us back here? Because in, in some ways I've, I've heard that these nuclear reactors were made by General Electric, right? It's America made to begin with. And it, 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 when it comes back, you complain about it. So what does that mean? So then I thought about these uh, bottles, which, you know, literally they're messages in a bottle, basically. And um, so it's a pun, a pun, a pun, a pun, a pun, but also kind of... Uh, a dialogue piece that makes you think about, well, whose fault is it? Whose responsibility is it? And, and the radiation, what kind of message does radiation give you? So um, I, have, I have these uh, kind of radial parts built into this. And basically I just pick up sound and feedback. So in the bottle, I have the, uh, the speakers faced inward in the bottle, and the antenna is uh, penetrating through the neck of the bottle, and the space between the antenna and the speaker about that far apart, and that creates a natural feedback. It's not really working too well, but um, when I have several of these together, clustered, they'll you know, create another kind of natural feedback because we um, it'll keep picking up the transmissions among each other. So um, <clears throat> it's kind of funny because it's kind of how COVID works. <laughs> So anyway, that, that, when I first showed this, it was um, in the uh, high desert, and it was like a satellite project um, of the high desert test sites. And there are four curators who asked me to do something at the site. I made, uh, I made the first three of these. And what I did was I would carry these and walk across the desert with it, and then I, wouldn't, I didn't really tell them what I was going to make, so they thought they, these were bombs. <laughs> and then I'll just, I'll just plant them in, in um, uh, mole holes, right? The, the, the holes for the snakes and moles. Just plant it in there and just leave it there. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was kind of like a, uh, another commentary on, you know, what, where these things came from, you know, what, what is a terrorist act, right? So, 
my dad, um, being a professor at a university in Tokyo, uh, he was a professor of comparative literature. And he would compare Japanese literature with, you know, American and French and English literature. And uh, he would run his um, courses by movements. So he would take like a surrealist movement and he would compare different uh, works. Um, and uh, naturally he would make friends with people in, in the 60s who had movements like the Monohas and the Gutai people uh, and Fluxus related people. So th that's how I kind of met some of these people who were guests in my house. And you know, these were these were the toys, <laughs> the new toys, right? The previous toys were brushes and now, now I got these things, which are, you know, household items <laughs> that happen to make sound. Um, and this kind of uh, became more of a major influence for me where I would make work uh, based or uh, around this, um, these ingredients. <laughs> Uh, I also have formed a um, kind of collaborative uh, performance project. It's, it's really kind of uh, derivative, but I call it Neofluxus. And uh, it's mainly, we've only done maybe four performances in Japan. And we go to different uh, sites where they have art festivals, triennials. Uh, and then I would um, ask the local musicians to participate with me and uh, like uh, and, and some of them would be you know professors or politicians or and then we would make a uh, new, new type of Lexus work together. And which led me to making, you know, homemade instruments. <laughs> and I would use these things to, uh, you know, uh, play in bands and stuff. Uh, this one happens to be an espresso bean can. <laughs> Very resonant. Um, this was one that I made. Uh, that I performed at the B Camp uh, opening at LACMA. Uh, uh, incidentally, this was with uh, Alan Nakagawa and Steve Roden and other people, uh, since we all went to school at the same time. <laughs> so I, um, I call this instrument Hakone. It uh, has two meanings. Um, hakone is a Japanese word, so hako is box, and the nepa is sound, so it's box sound. But it's also a, a name of a place in Japan, famous for hot springs. <laughs> so what I would usually do with this is uh, I kind of play it. And I'll just pick whatever instrument I have here, and I'll just start doing something with it. And the whole point is that I would tune it to the scale that is non-Western. Thank <laughs> you. 
kind of like that. And like other things I've told you, I always put in something that's contradictory, which is a music box. So we got this atonal thing going on in here, and I have something that's a little bit more melodic to give it that, you know, counterbalance. For me, making a piece is kind of like a performative act. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm basically performing with the material. So, um, you know, there might be peaks and, uh, you know, highlights in forming something where you feel like something's about to happen and then, and then you destroy it, right? By accident or, or intentionally. And in the pitfalls and, and the you know the climaxes, you you find this area that becomes like a uh, kind of like a harmony in a way, you know. And in that harmony, you you realize that uh, there there is a possibility that this could become something. And and in that potential, when that potentiality becomes a reality. Uh, you you develop a uh, vocabulary on the fly, right? Of making something, right? It just happens that you know um, something that you've done with your fingers, manipulation of some sort, works that rhythm or that pattern, right? And and basically, it's always new. You know, it's never the same movement, right? Kind of like playing a saxophone, right? You, you do these fingerings, and then and then it becomes something. So um, I think you just kind of uh, you you just kind of ride it, I guess. Or, you know, you run with it, and and just uh, trust the trusting and uh, the the will of uh, going in any direction and, and uh, seeing where it lands. The best thing is to really put yourself in places that you never even imagined before or um, and kind of uh, referencing a quote from Lincoln, I guess, you know, if you have an enemy, try and love them, try and get to know them, right? If you, if you have something that you don't feel really good at doing, then, then challenge yourself and, and put yourself in there. Um, because that's not only art in itself, it also, it, there's a bigger picture behind that. It, it, pre it prevents you from being prejudiced, right? If there's something unknown, if you, and if you have the effort, if you try hard enough to know what that is about, or even like it, or even love that, then that in itself is success as an artist.